So I'm going to be talking from more of an ops focus here. I've, it's been a lot of dev stuff happening, um, but I thought, so how many here people are, are from the ops side rather than dev? A few. How many of you use OpenStack at work? In production? Yeah, okay, cool, so not, not that many. Um, there's just who I am, 18 years experience at Canonical, worked at a few different places. It's uh, not really that interesting. So where do we use it? We have, there's about one, two, three, four or five different places that we actually have separate OpenStack clouds. One of them is Canonistack, which is a OpenStack instance that anyone in the company who is technical, who can understand how to use it, can use. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Um, we're currently running two different regions, and that's so that we can have different versions. So we've currently got Grizzly and Havana. In the past, we've had Folsom and Grizzly. So we just flip them as we do the upgrades. It means we get a good coverage of what's, what you can run and, and try out. Uh, we allow oversubscribing, and this gives devs the ability to test their services across multiple releases and see, see how it works, try it out. Um, this region isn't as, it, it's not production, so if it goes down, it's, it's a problem, but it's not something um, that's the end of the world. And it's a good learning environment. It's been a good learning environment for us as we've been getting up to speed with how OpenStack works, and also for the devs on how to deploy things. Um, so it gives you an idea of the sizing. Each region has five compute nodes with uh, 96 gig of RAM, so it's a fair amount of resources. Um, it's usually fairly overloaded, <laughs> just because they keep running all sorts of things on it. Um, strangely, Swift actually hasn't been picked up as much. It doesn't seem to be used as much as everything else. Um, Prodstack is the uh, production version of OpenStack where we run anything production. Uh, we also have what we call staging stack, which is essentially just different users on prod stack. What that means is we can deploy the code from the developers onto staging stack and know that we can mess around with it a little bit, but know that it's pretty close to production. So is that a separate infra or is it just a tenant? It's essentially a tenant. So essentially or? It's, yes. <laughs> well, it's different users. Uh, Yes, yeah, it's, it's a different tenant. Um, it's running all of our internally developed soft services. We're currently using Folsom with 12.04, and we're using the Ubuntu Cloud Archives for the backports of stuff to the latest LTS, uh, which seems to work pretty well. That's a list of things that run in ProdStack. So probably anyone who's had anything to do with Ubuntu, websites, certification, the product search, so the thing that everyone hates. <laughs> Um, but, but it is actually quite good. Um, the Ubuntu.com website, um, various other things. I don't know how many of those everyone will know about. Uh, the summit for the Ubuntu summits, uh, their website for that, for administering that, all, that all runs on the prod stack. And it's constantly increasing. We're constantly getting more and more things. The intention is to move as much as we can into it. Are we using web servers in instances rather than Swift? Yeah, we are using that. Could you repeat the question for the video? Oh, the question <laughs> was, are we running uh, web servers for content or using Swift? Was that an accurate? Yep. And no, we're basically using web servers for the stuff. Uh, so this gives you an idea of the sizing. So 20 compute nodes, so it's quite a bit bigger than everything else. Um, Swift, and we've got Ceph as well for persistent storage. Uh, we're currently working on the next version of ProdStack, which will be Havana on Precise, using the Ubuntu Cloud Archives. We'll have some HA, which we don't have, uh, so for Neutron and for the firewalls to start with, um, and we will gradually beef that up as we get through. Uh, 
So you can see here seven compute nodes to start with, so we'll gradually migrate services over and then move the hardware from the old prod stack across. So this is the software stack that we use. So overloading the word stack, but we've got <laughs> OpenStack on Ubuntu. We're using uh, Canonical's Metal as a Service to deploy things to the actual hardware. Uh, Juju, which is a service orchestration tool, and Landscape to help manage the actual service. So we use the Maz and Juju to deploy OpenStack to the bare metal, um, and then Juju to deploy onto OpenStack. And as a policy, we only use Juju to deploy onto OpenStack so that we've got a consistent deployment across, uh, and as I said, landscape to manage the servers. Both, both. So the, the question was, is that landscape to manage the servers or the VMs or both? And the answer is both. It's to upgrade the packages and stuff like that. And it's fairly safe because it's all precise LTS. Um, so just, do people understand the difference between service orchestration and config management? Yeah. Uh, essentially, service orchestration is like a universal remote that you can say, change to my TV channel and then play a DVD. Service orchestration is just hitting a button that says, watch a DVD. So config management is Puppet or Chef or Salt. Um, service orchestration is more like Heat or Juju. Um, I'll just quickly give a brief thing about what Juju is because I've been saying it. Uh, it's a service orchestration for the cloud, essentially. So you can deploy to OpenStack, to Metal as a Service, AWS, HP Cloud, Azure, uh, local containers, and there's providers being added to it. Uh, the charms give you the ability to pre-set up some configurable services, uh, and the Juju allows you to express relationships between those charms. I'll, it'll become a bit clearer in the next slide. Uh, and a bundle is essentially a predefined set of this. Um, and yeah, those are, you can then control where you deploy things to or just let it pick and just deploy to each its own VM. Um, so there's an example of deploying a six node Ceph cluster in five lines. You set up the environment. Oh, I probably didn't need that second line actually. Deploy the Ceph, which will have the mons in it, then deploy the OSDs and add a relationship to say, add the OSDs to the mons and that will allow it to monitor. Uh, probably no, there's, there is also a GUI for, that allows you to, instead of you doing command line tools, to just drag and drop and add relationships between things. Metal of a service is, it's a lot like uh, the, <laughs> Rob is talking about, it's, which, what's that one called? Ironic, yes, it's a lot like Ironic, it's just, that's what uh, Canonical's version is. Allows you to treat bare metal as essentially the same as a cloud guest. Um, developed, designed to scale out, and as I've said before, Juju can directly talk to it. So that means you've got a consistent deployment story whether you're talking about OpenStack on the bottom or what you're running on top of OpenStack, which is kind of nice. Uh, yeah and has a RESTful API that you can talk to, to to programmatically do things. This is where it's a little bit more interesting. It's something we've started doing recently, is continuous integration for services. So because we have a, a reproducible uh, way of deploying our services, so deploying a website, or deploying whatever we've got, we can use Jenkins and the code that we've got to integrate. It will actually spin up the VMs, deploy the instance for you, and then run whatever tests you define. So in this case, generally what we do is we define some Nagios checks that have to pass before where we can say, this is good, we can then consider deploying this out. Um, we've only done that to a few things, but it's already helped us find a lot of bugs 
with the services. Um, so this, and we're hoping to look at actually then, once things start passing, being able to then just deploy straight out. So the workflow, what happens is developer rocks up and says, hi, I've got a service I want to use. We go, right, can you deploy it? Do you, how do, you, do you know how you deploy it? Have you got um, Nagios checks to, to, to tell us how do we know that it's up? Um, what they do is they work up a charm on, and get it deployed to Canonistack, which they then work with, we've got a group called WebOps who deal with the devs. They then take that and actually work that into a decent deployable story onto a scaling stack. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and then once you, and that gives you the ability to actually see an end-to-end -end test of their new, brand new service that they've brought up and make sure everybody's happy with it and you're not touching any production data and it's, it makes things a lot easier. Once you're happy with that, you can, we then roll that through to production and to do updates, you can then, you then go back to the start, apply it to staging stack and roll it through again. So it's a continual cycle as you go through. And this is, gives you quite good separation of responsibilities between ops and devs. Um, but, and it's also increased dramatically the involvement rather than devs going, here's some code and running away. They're actually understanding a lot of the problems of how you do pr production deployments and stuff like that. Um, problems we found, this is perhaps an obvious one, but in moving services from not cloud to cloud, you do need a lot more hardware. And some of the management go, but it's cloud, shouldn't we have more hardware? Like, it should, shouldn't be using as much? But no, you've got to double up the hardware initially a bit to start moving things across before you can move hardware into it. Sometimes the devs think that they can just go, oh, I've committed something, roll it out. You've sort of got to explain to them how you need to put it through a quality assurance process and stuff. Um, and also the, our devs are getting up to speed with how to write apps that actually utilize the cloud, understanding how to write them in such a way that they can actually be scaled out properly. Um, we have, we've hit bandwidth limitations a few times, so we need to start looking at beefing up. No, we can't, the question is, are we running 10 gig? And no, we're running one gig. Don't even go there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. We discussed whether I was a heckle you. I'm going to heckle you. You are heckling. I knew I'm you. Real hardware. I would like to. It's not my call. <laughs> I have to work with what we're given. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. At least we're not bonding 100 meg. <laughs> At least we're not bonding 100 meg. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> you've got to pick the right hardware for the cloud compute nodes. We did have a problem where initially we picked probably the wrong uh, hard drives weren't as fast enough as they should have been. When you run up a lot of guests across it, you notice pretty quickly. Um, there are also problems where you have services that are being hit hard. Uh, if you've got VMs for those on the same physical box, you can notice issues, uh, standard sort of thing. We're trying to get to HA plus one. We're currently which means we, we would have the ability to remove a host to upgrade or patch or whatever while still keeping HA. Um, that's one of the things we're going to work on. And yeah, uh, co-locating services. In general, Juju will want to do services on their own instance. Uh, you can put them together, but it doesn't save you that much. Advantages, we have I mean, I've, I've listed a lot of problems, but this has also brought a lot of advantages to us. We've vastly improved the density of our services on servers. We've now got, um, we are buying a lot less servers. In, so instead of buying a full up machine to run like two services, we can run a lot more 
five or 10, and operating expenses are down. So when we release instances, we're, when we release Ubuntu, say, we're able to scale up the website quite easily. It's Juju add unit, and that's it. It'll scale it up for you. We don't have auto scaling yet, but that's on the cards, hopefully. And true re reproducibility of deployments has been a huge win. Rather than, oh, just tack this up for us, it's no, we, we know that we can take what you've given us and reproduce that somewhere else, um, which has been quite good. I uh, mentioned this one before, staging environments that match prod without too much extra hardware has been a good win as well, uh, rather than giving them some old dodgy box that doesn't have any decent performance. <laughs> it is actually, <laughs> yes. Um, you give them a new box that has. We give them a new box, but it's the same box that's running on production, so it's not going to be a huge disparity in performance. Um, and it has brought the devs and ops a lot closer together in awareness of the issues from either side. Uh, rather than, like I said before, throwing the code over the wall and running away, dev now understands a lot more about the requirements, even just as simple as understanding that you need to have a Nagios check to make sure that the thing is working. That's been a huge win. Um, we've been involved in the, in the development side of things in terms of developing products, the Juju, the mass and all that, which has helped because we've now looked feedback and saying, that's not a good idea. We don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> not always listened to, but at least we can say we've tried. Usually it's pretty good though. Um, yeah, and the whole dog fooding the OET, your, your own stuff has been quite useful. So that's the end of my slides. So any questions? Yep. Um, a great new office stack with Juju and experience in is, Sorry, what was that? Yes. Uh, so the question was, have we upgraded OpenStack with Juju? Um, not really, because like I said, we've got product ProdStack and we're then moving to ProdStack 4 and we've got a separate instance. Uh, mostly because we're going from Folsom to Havana and we're trying to add Neutron in and we're trying to add HA, so it's quite a big change. So uh, we're doing a sort of a separate, and then we're gonna migrate the services across. But it should be, you should be able to just do Juju upgrade charm and it'll upgrade things. So, so does that answer the question? Yeah, okay. Anyone else? So, with the upstream stage, we've been wanting to get, so we run all the tests on precise data integration tests. Yep. And we don't use Cloud Archive today because every time we turn it on, Lidbird breaks. Does Lidbird work for you? And if so, can you fix this? It, it, the question was, you're using Precise with, what was it? Cloud Archive, and libvert is breaking for you. Um, we haven't seen that. Where, uh, what version of OpenStack are you using? It's the Mac version, so current. Current, uh, so it'll be Havana? No, 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 this is no, no if this is the oh. gate checks for new. Oh, the gate checks. For the, the gate checks for OpenStack itself, if you oh. turn on Cloud, Cloud Archive test nodes, okay. it stops working because libvert under it oh. is haven't seen that, but we have a chat offline if, and see what we can work out if you want. Do you know off the top of your head what version of Libvert is in Cloud Archive? No. It's like one dot or is it like in your sort of OZAP one? Yeah, I don't know. I, we can check later and see what the differences are. We should call OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're done then. No one else? Nope. So then that service is CI tool. Uh, it, Mojo, it's an internal tool uh, that we haven't released yet because it's not in a, not quite finished. Okay. Um, so, um, Juju and Heat, uh, are they tools you develop in Canonical or are they yeah, kind of developed elsewhere? Juju is something we developed inside Canonical. Heat is developed by, it's an OpenStack oh, yeah. thing. Yeah. Okay, well, all right. Well, I'll be around all week if you've got any more questions. Um, thanks. thanks.